Good morning, folks. We've got a special report on the real cause of the Australian bushfires. We've got solar climate forcing, electroquakes, and plasma cosmology coming up, and we're starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com. We see that the southern coronal hole system and the bright active region trailing behind it dominate the southern hemisphere. Towards the end, we see another bright grouping over on the limb towards the left side. Folks, the south central active region is still decayed, and here we can really see the difference between a high latitude sunspot and the low latitude sunspot incoming. The one incoming is a late relic of cycle 24, but it's still hiding behind the limb for now, so let's go to the solar wind. We finally had a coronal hole stream ramp up beyond a modest intensification. It cracked 550 kilometers per second and drove a bit of geomagnetic instability. We'll be monitoring today, but no further intensifications are expected. The top quake of the last day was much more than its magnitude suggests. 5.7 struck Puerto Rico this morning, and folks, it's much different than getting a 5.7 in Japan or Indonesia. This region rarely creeps up into that magnitude, and hopefully it's not a foreshock of worse to come, especially since the Puerto Rico trench landslide potential on its north side is a way scarier East Coast USA tsunami threat than the Canary Islands volcanoes. Same size wave, quarter of the travel time. And we're off to Australia. We've been making it a point to come back to the situation with the bushfires about three times a week, and today, we need to go over a hard truth of the situation. We'll start with the indirect contribution. Folks, the Murray-Darling Basin in eastern Australia is under assault. From private dams to floodplain harvesting to selling water rights to foreign interests to restricting the rights of those whose land is run by the waterways. Now, while the worst of the fires is actually on the other side of the mountain range, closer to the coast, the stress of water in the basin affects policy and water scarcity all around it. And most importantly, the policy-aided drought there now leaves less transpiration into the atmosphere that could fall as rain as it enters the clouds in the basin and then goes towards the coast. Of course, when you have firefighters actually setting fires, that's not helping either. Certainly not all were arson, but many were. The restrictions placed on the preventative burning measures has honest firefighters actually blaming climate change policies themselves for these fires, which inevitably will be used to make more climate change policies. And to top it all off, folks, let's please remember that the weak polar vortex creates the opposite effect in Australia than it does to literally every other part of the world. Extra hot, extra dry conditions. And one of the most confirmed of all the solar climate forcings is that low sun activity drives those polar vortex weakenings. We have been in the deep of sunspot minimum and the vortex has acted accordingly. Plus, the South Magnetic Pole has left Antarctica already in this reversal phase, if you will recall, coming up south of Australia, which means that charged particles coupling to Earth's magnetic field from the solar wind are showering the region from above. Yes, it's a perfect storm. It's just not the perfect storm you've been hearing about on the news. Electroquakes are up next, and here's the quick backstory. We were part of a tiny group of allegedly crazy scientists early last decade, claiming electromagnetic pre-seismic signals could be used to forecast major quakes. Numerous papers got published, including two of our own, the first ever tying of solar polar magnetic fields to megathrust earthquakes. And in response, China and Italy launched the Seismo Electromagnetic Satellite, and the American Geophysical Union published the textbook, pre-earthquake processes, which is almost entirely about those electromagnetic precursors, and nobody's calling this crazy anymore. Now, if you've got all that, we're back to today, where it looks like the European Space Agency accidentally sent up a seismo-electromagnetic satellite of its own. Swarms journaling of the magnetic field and electric field precursors to these major quakes is remarkable, confirms what the world now knows, shouts out one of the world's first real earthquake forecasters in history, and makes me wonder if NASA's MMS mission can do the exact same thing. If you want to learn how to predict earthquakes or just peruse some of our forecasting tools with real-time data, check out quakewatch.net. The scoreboard does need updating there, but we've nailed all the big ones since the last update, and I've got better things to do than stat jab my ego. And one of those involves keeping up with plasma cosmology. Without it, most of the solar climate forcing and even electroquake science wouldn't work. 
most of the catastrophe science as well. And today, we've got illustrious simulations in the background, which are still good for simulating pieces of the cosmos, even with their inclusion of dark matter, and today we're seeing one of those uses as one of the key visual peculiarities of the Andromeda Galaxy suggests it may have gotten hit recently by another one. Now with the simulations, they can show indeed it may have been hit, very recently, by a galaxy up to a fourth of its already massive size. In general, however, those simulations fail because they lack the proper dusty plasma, electrodynamic action of it in the cosmic web, and of course, the largest scale magnetic fields as well. They are absolutely trying to better see and understand these fields, and to that end, as in this paper, they are doing a good job. But a problem arises when you have a hundred different subfields studying different spectra and dynamics of stars, galaxies, molecular clouds, filaments, and clusters in every different wavelength of light. It becomes unwieldy. In fact, with so many sub-investigations, we have seen the largest scale cosmologists actually give up trying to put it all in the picture. Not joking. They are all just digging in on their own topics, and this is where plasma cosmology comes in. Alphane and Peratt have those answers, and we arrive there in our plasma cosmology movie. Find it below this video, on our channel page, or at suspiciousobservers.org. It did take us a lot, if you'll recall, to get permission to post some of that previously classified information. We would appreciate you at least checking it out, hearing them out. Lastly, folks, I do hope you are caught up on parts one and two of the Plasma Climate Forcing series. Part three is coming here this week, and we are hitting those upper-level jets and the polar vortex, how the sun mechanically affects them. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here, but right now, it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.